Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the ABCs of ADA workshop presented by the City of Pasadena. Um, my name is Michelle Garrett. I'm a, city, I'm a project manager in the city manager's office, and our office works with a lot of businesses in the downtown community. Um, and when several businesses reported to us that there was a need for education um, of our small and independent business owners, along with any other business that might be interested, we quickly reached out to our Office of Accessibility with the city and uh, put together this workshop panel for you. Uh, before I introduce the facilitator today, I do want to point out that we will be uh, going straight through the presentation. So there's two presenters today. And if you have to use the restroom, you're more than welcome to um, go past the curtain here and that's where you'll find one. And I hope you have a pen and paper so you can take good notes because there's a lot of good information that we'll be sharing with you today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Allie Everett, who is our Accessibility Coordinator for the City of Pasadena. All right. Thank you, Michelle, um, and thank you to the Office of Economic Development and our local Old Pasadena Management District, um, who helped to facilitate bringing together this workshop for all of you. Um, today we are pleased to have speakers, two speakers joining us, both that have traveled from Northern California. Um, the first is Lainey Morgado, accessibility professional from the Pacific ADA Center. She's going to be starting out today with a, an overview of the ADA requirements, sort of a training on that. So that's going to be the bulk of the presentation. Um, so we call this the ABCs of ADA for businesses, it's kind of like the ABCs to Zs for businesses. Um, and then we'll be turning it over to Debbie Wong, who is a senior architect and certified access specialist with the Division of the State Architect, and also the technical administrator for the CAS program. So she'll be talking to you all a little bit about what the CAS program is and how you may be able to, may be able to utilize it for access for your businesses. And then we will have plenty of time at the end for questions, so please note your questions um, so that you can have those addressed at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lainey Morgado. Good afternoon, everybody. We're after lunch, so I'm going to try and have really good energy <laughs> for you all. Um, again, I am Lainey Morgado, um, soon to be back to my maiden, Lainey Davidson. So if you're in search of me after today's presentation, this is my final presentation under Lainey Morgado, so I'll be findable under Lainey Davidson in the future. Um, I am here on behalf of the Pacific ADA Center. Um, I also am the ADA Coordinator and Disability Access Manager for the County of Marin in Northern California, as well as I have a consulting business that um, provides accessibility services for uh, public agencies and private businesses. So the Pacific ADA Center offers um, technical assistance. You can call the 800 number at any time and get free technical assistance if you have any questions about the Americans with Disabilities Act. They provide materials, so there's lots of great resource documents on the website. Um, they have listservs, so they provide wonderful webinars that are free of charge, um, and you can get access to their materials. Um, they also provide training. There are fee for the training services, but it's really based on your resources, so they'll work with you to come up with a program that meets your needs um, as well as your resources. Um, they are located in Oakland, but they're part of the same region. Um, we're in Region 9, so it covers the whole state of California. Um, so Pacific ADA Center, wonderful resource. If you have follow-up questions about today's presentation, you can always contact them. Um, and they have real live human beings that answer the phone to help answer your questions. Thank you for fixing the clicker, Allie. Um, so the mission of the, um, the excuse me, Pacific ADA Center is to facilitate voluntary compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act through free confidential technical assistance. And again, they also conduct training and distribute materials on the ADA. Um, I happen to be a member of the listservs for all the regional ADA centers because I find value in the um, information that each of them provide. They have different specialties and they have subject matter experts at each. So you can um, join and get information from all the regions if you're gonna be a real accessibility nerd like I am. So disability demographics. Um, there are about 41 million people uh, in the United States or 12.7% of the population that are people with disabilities. And these are people that have self-identified as people with disabilities. This doesn't capture a whole other portion of the population that may be persons with disabilities but don't identify as such or don't even realize that they're a qualified individual with a disability. Um, so you know, we can assume that that's really an underrepresented statistic. Um, as of 2017, 10.2% of Pasadena's residents 
identify as people with disabilities. Um, and as our population ages, it's important to remember that the prevalence of disability will increase. So disability is the equal opportunity minority group. Anyone can join at any time. Um, and if we're all lucky to live long enough, we will all be people with disabilities. So this is really about us, not them. And it's really about making our services and goods available to the entire population. Um, people with disabilities represent more than $200 billion in discretionary spending. And if you think about that, that's not just people with disabilities, but also their friends and family. So if I go to a business and I feel that I'm not treated well and I report that to my friends and family, they're probably not likely to patronize that business either. So the ramifications of not being inclusive can be really um, wide and far-reaching, particularly when dealing with people with disabilities and accessibility issues. So it's important to remember that this is a significant portion of the population. Um, this is just a graph showing how the prevalence of disability increases with age. Um, you know, we have a large portion of our population, the baby boomers again, who are aging and they're going to want to be able to do things like age in place and have access to the same programs and services that they've always had access to. Um, and so we, as business owners, are going to have to do our due diligence to make sure that we're providing our services and we're creating our facilities in ways that are accessible to people with changing needs. So the legal definition of disability is an individual with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life activities. The duration is usually long or greater than six months, and you can't consider the presence of mitigating measures. So for instance, if someone is a person with hearing loss and they have a cochlear implant, they still are a protected person with a disability under the ADA, even though they have some technology that helps them. Um, it doesn't negate the fact that they're still a person with a disability. Um, the definition of disability includes a person who has a record of such impairment or someone who is regarded as having such an impairment. So for instance, if there is a person and you think that that person has mental illness and because of that you de deny them a service or a program or participation in one of your programs, um, they're a covered person under the ADA, even though they might not technically be a person with a disability because the discrimination was on the basis of disability. And we have a lot of content, and I speak rather quickly, so I'm going to move through it. Please do write your questions down, though, because we will have Q&A time, and I do want to be able to answer any questions that you have. And any questions I'm unable to answer today, again, we can direct them to the Pacific ADA Center. So the ADA was enacted in 1990. Next year, it will be 30 years old. Um, we've made lots of um, headway, and there are a lot of successes to be celebrated um, as the ADA has been implemented over all these years. The civil rights, it's a civil rights law and it's built on the principles of equal opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. One area um, that really requires a lot of work still is the area of employment. Um, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities has basically remained unchanged since the ADA was signed into law. And so uh, that's one area where lots of work still needs to be done. Um, there are many people with disabilities that are unemployed or underemployed. Um, but there are many successes to celebrate. And among those successes are having a wonderful building code that includes lots of access provisions to ensure that people with disabilities can integrate into society and participate in all aspects of life. So there are different titles to the ADA. Title I is employment. Title II covers state and local government. Title III, public accommodations. That's what we're going to primarily be talking about today. Title IV, telecommunications. And Title V is miscellaneous provisions. So public accommodations, that includes commercial facilities. Uh, these are businesses that provide goods or services to the public. And we see lots of examples here. Entertainment venues, service establishments, places of ex exercise or recreation, um, uh, stations used for public transportation. So there are a lot of different, excuse me, places of public accommodation that are protected under the ADA. So, sorry, I misspoke. Not that are protected under the ADA, that are covered under the ADA and offer protections for people with disabilities to their access. So, Title III requirement overview. So, these are the things that places of public accommodation must uh, or must not do under the ADA. Um, you must not discriminate on the basis of disability. Pretty straightforward. Um, you must reasonably modify your policies and procedures when necessary to services for customers with disabilities. So, this is making sure that um, the way that you typically do business might need to be changed in order to provide that service to a person with a disability. 
um, you need to provide effective communication, comply with current standards for accessible design in new construction and alteration work, and remove architectural barriers in existing facilities when it is readily achievable to do so. And we're going to go through each of these in more detail. So general non-discrimination, I'm just going to read this for you. No individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation by any private entity who owns, leases, or leases to or operates a place of public accommodation. So that's very broad, um, and it's broad on purpose to ensure that um, this civil rights law is really all-encompassing and ensures equal access and participation for people with disabilities. So general dis non-discrimination includes the right for people with disabilities to participate, and then equality in that participation or the benefits that are gained through access and participation. Um, you cannot have standards, criteria, or other methods of administration that have the effect of discriminating on the basis of disability. You may not perform retaliation or coercion. Um, no discrimination against an individual who is associated with a person with a disability. So for instance, if I have a child with a disability um, and maybe there are some behaviors associated with that child's particular diagnosis and you decide that you don't want myself to participate in a program because I'll have my child with me and you think it will be disruptive, I would be a covered person under the ADA because you're discriminating against me on the basis of my association with a person with a disability. And then insurance conditions or rates can't be used as a basis to refuse service to an individual with a disability. Okay, integrated setting. When we talk about integrated setting, we're saying that the goods, services, and programs are provided in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the particular individual. So I think this is a good time for us to think about that this is really about an individualized case-by-case -case basis. So everybody's functional limitations of their disability, so the manifestations of their disability plays out in a very unique and individualized way. Um, and so when you're dealing with modifications to your policies and procedures, you really have to deal with the individual that is seeking the modification and what their particular needs are. So that's why it says appropriate to the needs of the individual. Um, provision of goods, services, or programs that are separate or different are only permissible if they're necessary to be that way um, in order for them to be as effective as to those provided by others. So for example, if there's a child um, who is um, on the autism spectrum and they have a sensory disability and uh, they want to participate in a program but it's a group program and the nature of the program would be too disruptive for them to be able to enjoy that program, you might provide them a separate session where they individually can enjoy the same experience but in a way that they're able to get all of the benefits of it where it would be too overwhelming if you just provided, allowed them to attend the general program and participate the way that you offer the service to everybody else. Um, businesses may not deny participation in goods, services, or programs that are not separate or different. So you could not require that child to participate in an individualized uh, version of the program or service that you're providing, but you can offer it as an accommodation. Surcharges. So you cannot charge people with disabilities um, fees to cover the cost of complying with the ADA requirements. Now, if you charge fees for your goods and services, you can charge people with disabilities those fees. It just means that you cannot charge a person with a disability when you wouldn't normally charge any other member of the general public. Um, there is one instance, so in California, uh, people who have disability placards or disabled um, dry, um, license plates can park at metered parking without feeding the meter. Um, but if they park in a off-street parking garage, then the owner is allowed to charge people with disabilities to park there. So there's an, an example of an exception where um, people with disabilities are not expected to pay for metered parking. And that's only in the state of California that I'm aware of. So the landlord-tenant relationship. So landlords and tenants are both considered public accommodations for the purposes of complying with the ADA requirements. Um, An allocation of responsibility for compliance may be determined by lease or other contract. And what that means is that doesn't um, alleviate the legal responsibility of both the landlord and the tenant for adhering to the ADA requirements, but it does say that through contractual agreement, they can decide who will be doing the implementation. So maybe the contract says that the tenant will do the facility work necessary to bring the facility into compliance uh, with accessibility laws and regulations. So you can divvy up the responsibility for implementation, but the legal responsibility still falls upon both. You can't delegate away 
your responsibility as a landlord or a tenant to ensure that your goods and services are accessible. Reasonable modification. So a reasonable modification is the change in the usual way that we do business. Um, and it's necessary to ensure that people with disabilities aren't denied the opportunity to participate. So this is going to require modification to policies, practices, and or procedures. So this doesn't mean that you just allow people with disabilities into your facilities or to apply for your programs or participate in your services. It means that oftentimes you're going to have to change the way you're providing those things. So for instance, maybe you have um, meetings where people get together or events and someone with a disability might request a sign language interpreter. So that's a different way than you usually would provide your service. And while you are inviting everyone, you may need to provide that individual with a sign language interpreter in order for them to have equal access to the um, service that you're providing. So some examples of reasonable modifications. Um, you could modify a rule allowing only one customer into a dressing room if that individual requires assistance with changing. Um, retrie retrieving items from high shelves. Maybe you typically don't provide that assistance um, to customers, but you may need to provide assistance to a customer with a disability. Describing items that are available for sale. Um, another example would be reading the menu to someone who has vision loss. Um, assisting customers with maneuvering through store aisles, and then permitting what we call other power-driven mobility devices. Sometimes we refer to them to, as OPDMDs. In my day job, I work for a government agency. We really like acronyms. <laughs> so I try not to use the acronym because I understand this is new terminology to many of you. But other power-driven mobility devices are basically, um, when the ADA standards were updated, it allows more than just wheelchairs into facilities and on, our, and on grounds. So another power-driven mobility device is a device other than a wheelchair that a person with a disability uses to get around. So an example of that might be a Segway. Um, I watched a documentary once about a gentleman who had a progressive disorder where um, his joints fused and he got to decide what position he wanted to spend his life in and he chose standing up. But it made it very difficult for him to travel from here to there. He had to go by gurney, and it made it really difficult for him to visit places of public accommodation. But he realized with the ad advent of the Segway that he could control balance and he could use a Segway. So that was hugely liberating for that individual. So in that circumstance, we'd want to modify our um, policies and procedures to allow that individual to bring the Segway into our facilities. And um, Allie has done a wonderful job with this presentation and given you guys lots of links. And she's going to share the presentation after today so that you can explore and get more information than what we're able to cover in this brief presentation today. Service animals. This is a lot of people's favorite topic. I get lots of questions about service animals, both in public and private practice. Um, so public accommodations shall modify their policies, practices, and procedures to permit the use of a service animal by a person with a disability. And we're going to go a little bit more in depth about service animals. So service animal is a dog. It could be any size of dog, any breed of dog. But um, the updates to the ADA, the 2010 updates, said that it's relegated only to a dog, with one exception. You also have to modify your policies and practices to allow a miniature horse. Why a miniature horse? Well, um, there's a lot of training um, and work that go into um, getting a service animal ready to provide services. And miniature horses live longer. They're very intelligent, they can be house trained, um, and they're very good for persons with stability issues because they can be used for assistance with stability and for transferring. These are mostly found in rural areas. I've never seen one in a place of public accommodation except there was an article in the SF Gate that there was a miniature horse on BART in Oakland. And as it turns out, it was a woman who was training the service animal to go and be housed with someone, a person with a disability. To, to be used. So they are, they are out there, and we must modify our policies and procedures to allow them. Emotional support, comfort, and companion animals, um, they're not considered service animals, and they're not covered under the ADA. But it's important to note that they are covered other, under other accessibility laws and regulations. So the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and also um, Title I of the ADA that covers employment, you may have to provide a reasonable accommodation to allow an emotional support animal. So if you are a provider of housing, public housing, and you have a no pet policy, and a person with a disability requests uh, a reasonable accommodation to have their emotional support animal, you would need to engage in the interactive process with them to determine whether that's reasonable and whether you need to modify your uh, policies and procedures. 
Same thing goes for employment. Um, if I have an employee come to me and they say that they want to bring their emotional support cat into the office and I have to engage in the interactive process with them to identify whether that's reasonable and we look at their individual case and on the work setting and um, go through that whole process to make that determination. But in your um, public accommodations, if you have stores and so on and so forth, what's covered under the ADA as of today are service animals, which is a dog or in some exceptions, a miniature horse. So the animal must be under the handler's control at all times and it must be house trained. Um, they're permitted in all areas where customers are normally allowed to go. There's no requirement for licensing or certification. So you cannot ask the individual to produce a certificate or a license showing that it's a service animal. There are lots of agencies that provide that, that provide vests and certificates. Um, it's not illegal for them to do that, but you cannot deny someone access to your um, your services because they don't have those certifications. Um, a person can train the animal themselves to do the worker tasks that they need. And there's lots of work that service animals do outside of just seeing eye dogs. There are animals that can detect when a person's going to have a seizure. There are animals that can detect when a person who has post-traumatic stress is getting near a panic attack. Um, and then there are some service animals that um, fetch items for people or assist in opening doors. So leash requirements don't always work. Um, some people, because of the nature of their disability and the work their service animal does for them, they need their animal to be able to roam freely. It still needs to be under the handler's control. Um, so if the dog or miniature horse is not obviously a service animal, so for instance, if a person who is blind comes in with a seeing eye dog, that's going to be fairly obvious to you, and you don't want to question them about um, having their service animal in your facility. Now, if the animal is not under their control, if it's barking or growling at people, if it's bathrooming in your facility, then you can approach the person and talk to them about it. And there's two questions that you can ask. Is the animal required because of a disability? So you never want to ask what the person's disability is. It's not a legal question that you're legally allowed to ask, and it's not really going to give you any information that's usable. If someone gives you their diagnosis, someone says, well, I have CP. Well, if you don't know what CP is, then you don't have the information you need to move forward and make a determination. And then even if they tell you, well, that's cerebral palsy, and you don't know how that um, condition affects that individual, right, because the functional limitations will be different for each person, you still don't have any good information. So yes, it's not legally permissible, but I think more importantly, it really doesn't give you any information, so it's not helpful to you um, in any event. And then you can ask, what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? If it's a service animal, the person should be able to very clearly explain to you what the animal does for them. Um, and it must be under their control. I had a gentleman come in to file a complaint with my office because a restaurant asked him to leave because they said his service animal was not under his control. And he was very upset. And he says, my dog is always under my control. And I said, oh, where's your dog? And the dog had wandered out of the office and was four or five doors down digging through somebody's garbage. That is not under the handler's control. Um, so you can ask for people to remove their service animals, but you can't make the person leave. Oftentimes, the person won't be able to be present without their service animal because they do rely on the worker tasks that that animal provides. So if that's the instance and they can't be there without their service animal, then you need to still work to provide that same service. So. If they came in to apply for a specific program, maybe you can set up a phone appointment with them and fill out the paperwork for them over the phone. So you still want to make sure that you're modifying your policies and procedures to provide that same service to the person and give them access to your goods, even if, for whatever reason, whether it's a service animal or not, it's just not under the handler's control at that particular time. So ticketing, um, reasonable modification in ticketing. Individuals with disabilities must have an equal opportunity to purchase tickets for accessible seating, and they need access to purchase tickets during the same hours, via the same methods, in the same quantity, and under the same terms, conditions, and promotions as members of the general population. So you cannot have, for instance, an online ticketing software package that is not accessible to people with disabilities, but is available to members of, other members of the general public 24 hours a day. Uh, forcing people with disabilities to call between the hours of 8 and 5 to purchase tickets. So that's not equitable. Um, you need to make sure that it's under, the, again, same hours, methods, quantity, terms, conditions, and promotions as everyone else. Um, accessible seating is, are wheelchair spaces and companion seats. Generally, you're going to want to provide three contiguous companion seats for each uh, wheelchair accessible space that you're providing. Um, and accessible seating must be made available at all price levels. So you can't have all the accessible seating 
either in the most expensive seated area or the least expensive, it should be dispersed. Um, when it's not possible due to structural barriers, the same quantity of tickets must be made available at the same price in a nearby or similar accessible location. There are lots of requirements related to ticketing, and those can be find again, found again on ada.gov. For instance, there's information there about how long you have to hold the accessible seating, when you can release them for sale to the general population, and so on and so forth. So exceptions to reasonable modification. When do you not have to modify your policies and procedures for people with disabilities? If it causes a fundamental alteration or a change in the essential nature of how you do business. So for example, um, a clothing store is not required to have uh, staff assist customers with disabilities in changing and trying on clothes in the dressing rooms unless they also offer that service for the rest of the general population. Um, legitimate safety requirements. So these are necessary for safe operation. And these have to be based on actual risks, not speculation, stereotypes, or generalizations. Um, it's really important um, if you're doing any exception to reasonable modification that you very um, accurately document your rationale for why you're unable to provide the service, and then also document your efforts to provide the service in another manner or to do your best to ensure that you're giving that individual every opportunity possible and feasible um, to participate. Direct threat. So if there's a direct threat to the health or safety of others, um, then you don't need to modify your policies. But this is individualized, again, and um, it's based on the nature, duration, and sever severity of the risk, the probability that potential injury will occur, and whether reasonable modification or the provision of auxiliary aids or services will mitigate the risk. So basically, this provision of the law is saying that you really need to do your due diligence and exhaust all options in order to include people with disabilities and provide them access to your goods and services. Are we doing okay? I know it's a lot of information and I talk fast. There's really yummy looking cookies and coffee, so if you need sugar <laughs> to get through it. But you guys are doing, you look perky, so this is good. No one's sleeping. Usually there's at least one person sleeping when I present, so it's really good for the self-esteem. Effective communication. So communication with people with disabilities must be equally effective as communication with people without disabilities. Um, the purpose of this um, section is to ensure that people with disabilities can communicate with, receive information from, and communicate information to the public accommodation. And this applies specifically to people with vision, hearing, and speech disabilities and companions with such disabilities. The key to effective communication is to consider the nature, length, complexity, and context of the communication, as well as the person's normal method of communication. So for instance, um, if you are a lawyer and you're discussing very complex aspects of a client's case, you, and they're a person with hearing loss, you likely may want to get a sign language interpreter there um, to make sure that they're really understanding all of the components of that communication, because the nature of that communication is that the details are important. If an individual comes into your office, uh, for instance, comes into my office and asks directions to the building department, I probably don't need to request a sign language interpreter to help with that. Maybe I can write, write them a written note or walk them over. So there might be another way to provide equally effective communication. But it really depends on the individual. Again, these are all very individualized, case-by-case -case basis scenarios, which makes them a little challenging, but it's also a very unique opportunity to use your creative skills to solve problems. And usually, business owners are really good at that. So. That's a good applicable skill set. Again, more information on ada.gov. I go to that website. I've been doing accessibility work for 15 years, and I go to that website several times a week, and I always find new and interesting things there. So it's a really wonderful resource. So auxiliary aids and services for effective communication. So these are the things that we can use to provide equally effective communication. Qualified interpreters. And these include, um, among other types of interpreters, American Sign Language interpreters. It's important to remember that um, people who are born deaf and speak ASL, they learn ASL as the first language, American Sign Language. When they learn to read and write, they're learning a second language. English is not at all the same language as American Sign Language. So there will be a communication barrier for some individuals that are native ASL speakers um, when you're dealing with written and um, with reading and writing information. 
So it's important to remember that. I didn't know that when I started in this. I thought it was very interesting. Um, assistive listening devices, so those can be handheld or in some larger places of public accommodation like arenas and theaters, usually assistive listening devices are required to be built in and so they're part of the PA system. Braille material. If you get a request for materials in Braille, it's really important to get very specific information from the requestor about what portion of the document they want transcribed because a couple of pages um, of text can be multiple, multiple pages in Braille. Um, so you want to make sure you're being very specific, not only to help you in providing the customer with what they need, but also to provide the customer ease of access to information. For instance, if you have a 700-page document and they really only want page 7, you don't want to give them this stack of Braille that they have to then go through um, to try to find the information they want. So that's why it's really important to engage with people. Talk to them about what their particular needs are, because um, it's about customer service, right? And when you're in business, customer service is a really important component. This is all just an extension of good customer service. Exchange of written notes, reading written items out loud, repeating ver verbal instructions as needed. So oftentimes people with certain developmental disabilities or cognitive disabilities might not be able to um, absorb information the first time you tell them or in the same way that you normally communicate. So if someone's experiencing just the excuse me, difficulty with that, you might try another approach, speaking more slowly, repeating what you've said, writing things down, um, allowing them time to process. Those are all really important um, alternatives that you can use. And it's also important to remember that not all disabilities are visible. Um, I am a person with several invisible disabilities that you can't see. If you spend enough time with me, you might be able to figure some of them out, um, but they're not visible when you first see me. So it's important to remember that not every disability is going to present itself to you, and you might have to do a little more um, engagement with the individual to find out what they need. And then utilizing the National Relay Service. This is a wonderful free service. Um, in California, it's called the California Relay Service. You pick up the phone and dial 711, and it allows you to call anyone that um, has a hearing loss or a speech disability. There are relay operators that answer the line, um, and they are trained to um, communicate with people with speech disabilities, as well as to use TTYs, which are sort of like two-way pagers. It's sort of older technology. Most people use text and email, but there are still people that use TTYs, so we want to make sure we can communicate with them. Um, you speak to the relay operators if you were speaking directly to the person with a disability, so I would pick up and say, I'd like to place a call to, and I give the number. And then when they say the person is answered, I would just say, hi, this is Lainey calling from the County of Marin. I would like to talk to you about, so you don't speak, you don't say, tell the interpreter, please tell the person on the other end that I would like, you just speak directly as, as if you were having direct communication with the individual, and then the interpreter takes care of the rest. If you're interested in watching videos about how this works or learning more, um, if you just Google California Relay Service 711, they have a great uh, website with lots of information. They also offer free equipment to certain people that qualify that ha allow um, sound ampl amplification for phones and so on and so forth. Auxiliary aids and services for effective communication. To be effective, auxiliary aids and services must be provided in an accessible format and be provided in a timely manner. So you don't want someone waiting three months to provide them with an interpreter or other type of auxiliary aid and service when everyone else uh, has access to the service in a couple of days. Right? So you want to make sure it's in a timely manner and equitable. And that it's done in such a way to protect privacy and to promote independence. So really, in all circumstances, you want to allow people with disabilities to independently access your goods and services the way that any other customer would. Um, there may be certain circumstances where that's not possible, but that's really the end goal. This is a civil rights law, so we want to make sure that we're respecting people's independence. Um, and then protecting privacy. So you know, if you are reading aloud information that normally would be written down, and it's you know, private information, make sure that the person is pulled aside and that you're respecting people's privacy. So public accommodations are encouraged to consult with the individual with a disability to determine what type of aid or service is appropriate. So when I put on my public agency hat, I'm required to give preference to what the individual is requesting, but as public accommodations, you're just encouraged to do that. Um, I strongly encourage you to do that because if you don't do that, then it's probably not going to end up being effective and then you could wind up violating the effective communication requirements anyway. So really, you know, people with disabilities usually have been living with their disabilities and they know what they need. So just listening is usually the best way to solve the problem. Information and communication technology. So this is all the digital stuff. 
Um, so your websites and documents that are posted online, online interactive services, social media accounts, these are all required to be accessible. Um, title three, so that's what uh, title of the ADA again that you guys all fall under, public accommodations. Um, well, most of you. I understand there are some Title II agencies here, so I don't want to shut out my Title II brothers and sisters in the room. Um, but Title III website accessibility lawsuits increased 177% from 2017 to 2018. So this is a really hot area um, in litigation. Um, and then talking about a Ninth Circuit case here on this slide with Domino's, and the court decided that ADA does apply to websites of public accommodations, and that places of public accommodation are required to provide effective communication through auxiliary aids and services. How do we make our websites accessible? Well, there is this wonderful organization called the WC3 that created the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and basically, the way it's set up right now is that the government's telling us you have to bake a cake, but we're not gonna give you a recipe for how to bake that cake. But if you know where there's a really good cake recipe, I'm not a master baker, so I don't know about you, but I'm gonna use the recipe. So the web content accessibility guidelines are the recipe. They tell you exactly what you need to do to make all of your digital stuff accessible. Um, and that applies again to social media and uh, newsletters, any digital content that you're pushing out. And again, great links here so you can look deeper into those requirements if necessary. Just as a side note at the County Marin, we just hired a digital accessibility manager just to handle this because it's a huge arena to tackle and it's a very specialized skill set. So don't expect that you'll be able to go in and remediate all of your websites because um, it takes not only knowledge of, uh, about technology and expertise around coding and so on and so forth, but it also takes someone who knows about disability and how people with disabilities use technology. So it's a very specific skill set. Um, and you're often going to have to elicit the help of others to get your websites in good order. So there are exceptions to effective communication. Again, if it causes a fundamental alteration to the nature of goods or services, if it's an undue burden, so if it incurs significant difficulty or expense. A couple things to consider if you are going to claim undue financial burden is that the court is going to look at the financial resources of the entire agency or organization, even if there's a parent agency. So, for instance, if I say I can't provide that accommodation because I only have X amount of dollars allocated to this particular function um, or this event, if someone with a disability were to sue me, the court would look at the funding available to the whole agency, not just what was allocated to that event. So then I wouldn't be qualified to um, have that exception. So important to remember that the resources of the entire agency are taken into consideration. Impact of changing economic conditions may be considered. Um, and again, parent company, um, they look at the administrative and financial resources of both. And in general, businesses with greater resources are expected to do more. So that kind of makes sense, right? So the bigger you grow, the more access you're expected to provide. As you have more resources, you're expected to allocate some of those resources to improving your accessibility. And then if you can't provide that particular form of communication because it causes a fundamental alteration or it is an actual undue burden, you still want to look at other ways that you can still provide information and resources to that person. Physical accessibility. So my building was built prior to the ADA, so it's, it's grandfathered, right? No, there's no grandfather clause in the ADA. Um, the ADA physical accessibility requirements seek to increase access for people with disabilities while recognizing the financial constraints of small businesses. So the expectations under the ADA for public and private agencies is a bit different um, when it comes to physical accessibility. There's a wonderful ADA primer for small businesses, again, on ADA.gov, and it covers a lot of the common accessibility challenges and offers solutions for small businesses. So I recommend uh, that you check that out as well. There are physical accessibility standards put out both by federal and state. Um, you might have some local laws and ordinances that relate to accessibility, so you want to make sure that you um, look into that with your local jurisdictions to make sure that there aren't any other additional requirements there. The federal ADA standards, um, the original standard was the 1991 ADA standards for accessible design, and the current standard is the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. The California Building Code, Chapter 11B, applies to public 
buildings, public accommodations, commercial buildings, and public housing. And then Chapter 11A has accessibility specific to housing. So if you are in the housing arena, you want to make sure you take a look at Chapter 11A also. Depending on the funding that's going into the housing, you might be subject to the requirements of both chapters. So it's important to look into that if you think you might be in that situation. Um, the application of these laws is to the fixed or built elements of temporary and permanent buildings and facilities. And the contents of both, are there, they've been aligned recently, so they're configured very similarly. There's the scoping section, which tells you the what, and then the technical section, which tells you how, how to make it accessible. So we can see here in a chart the federal and state requirements for new construction uh, lined up side by side. So new construction, the federal requirement is you comply with the 2010 ADA standards. The state requirement is that you comply with chapter CBC 11B. So you might pull a permit with your local jurisdiction building department and get approved, but they're only looking at the state requirements for accessibility. They're not going to audit you based on the federal requirements. So it will be your responsibility to research those requirements and make sure that you're meeting them. Again, many of them are aligned, but there are some discrepancies, so you wanna make sure that you have a knowledgeable person helping you with that. Um, for alterations, again, elements altered comply with the 2010 ADA standards to the maximum extent feasible under the federal requirements, and under state requirements, they are altered to comply with Chapter 11B to the maximum extent feasible. In existing buildings, the federal requirement is that you remove barriers when it is readily achievable to do so. Barrier removal measures comply with requirements for alterations to the maximum extent feasible. Um, and there's no state requirement for uh, barrier removal. So readily achievable barrier removal says that you will go through your buildings and facilities and identify what work needs to be done to create accessibility. And then as it is readily achievable to do so, you will do so. So based on your access to resources and the time that it takes, how it alters the nature of your business, you come up with a timeline to remediate all of these barriers that exist. Um, these are, the federal requirements are enforced by the United States Department of Justice, and you won't hear from the United States Department of Justice unless you've done something wrong. So remember that, if you don't hear from them, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, if we, and the state requirements, again, those are enforced by the local jurisdiction's building official, so they should be doing an accessibility audit as part of your building permit process. Alterations, so an alteration is any change that affects or could affect the usability of a building. So remodeling, renovating, doing rehab work, reconstruction, changing or rearranging, those are all alterations. These don't include normal maintenance, like roofing, painting, or wallpapering, but just because you call something maintenance does not mean it is maintenance. So make sure that you're really looking at whether it constitutes an alteration when you decide whether or not um, standards need to apply and which standards you need to apply. Safe harbor, so elements that were built or altered in compliance with the accessibility standard that was in place at the time don't need to be modified to comply with current standards just because the current standard's different. So simply by virtue of the new building code comes out and there is a requirement in the new building code that was not in effect at the time you built your facility, if your facility was compliant at the time it was built, then you're not in violation of that particular statute. If that element is later altered, safe harbor no longer applies. So as soon as you alter something, then you have to comply with the current accessibility standards. And it's really important to document your efforts. So keep really good records of when you do alterations, what standard they were done under, so that you have access to all those records if anyone were to call it into question. Alterations to historic buildings. So they must be qualified historic buildings. So you can't just say, this building I have is really old, it's a historic building, I'm gonna follow the historic building code. No, that building has to be listed in or eligible for either the National Register of Historic Places or designated as historic under a state or local um, law. So it has to have a formal designation or certification as an historic facility in order to follow the historic codes. In the 2000 ADA standards, it says that alterations shall comply to the maximum extent feasible with current accessibility standards for alterations. And there are some exceptions for accessible routes, entrances, and bathrooms. When it's not feasible to provide physical access, alternative methods must be provided. So for instance, there are a lot of historic towns that have these old raised um, wooden sidewalks 
It's really hard to make those accessible because of the material used and the access to them. So if it is um, a qualified historic facility, then you can provide other accessible means of entrance into the building. So you can construct other ramps and accessible routes so that people with mobility devices are still able to access the facility. And the determination of feasibility must be made by the state historic preservation officer. So you don't get to make that determination independently. Um, and then again, in the California Building Code, alterations comply with the state historic building code and there's a link to that as well. So public accommodations must remove architectural barriers in existing buildings, including communication barriers um, that are structural in nature, so that would be like signage, um, where, removable, where removal excuse me, is readily achievable. So what does readily achievable mean? Um, readily achievable barrier removal is easily accomplishable and able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. And it's de determined on an element by element basis. So same when we're looking at modifying our policies and procedures, or we're providing accommodations to people, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So this is an element-by-element -element basis. So just because one portion of your facility um, re uh, barrier removal is not readily achievable, it doesn't mean you don't need to do any of the work anywhere, right? You're gonna look at it on an element-by-element -element basis. It's based on the size and resources of the business. Again, impacts of changing economic conditions may be taken into consideration and can postpone some barrier removal. Um, and businesses with more resources are expected to do more. Uh, and barrier removal is a continuing obligation. So it's not a one and done. Um, you have your priority list of things that you're gonna be working on and you need to continually be working on it. This is another area where documentation is really important because your financial res resources may likely fluctuate from year to year. So you wanna be able to document, you know, this year income wasn't as good, we were only able to modify the steps, but next year we project that we're gonna be bringing in a lot more revenue, so we'll be able to do a lot more work. So make sure that you're really documenting in case anyone calls into question what you've done or what you plan to do. So there are priorities for barrier removal that are already laid out for you. You must pri provide access to your business from public sidewalks, parking, and public transportation. So this might require you to provide entrance ramps, making your entrances wider, or provide accessible parking on site. You must provide access to your goods and services, so adjusting display racks. One really easy way to make sure that your um, goods and services are accessible if you have materials or items is to display them vertically instead of horizontally. So don't have all of the same item on the top shelf, display them vertically, so in columns. So you have all the same brochure and all levels of the display rack going all the way down. And that's how you display them. That way a person who's seated in a mobility device or a person of short stature can get to any material they want without having to ask for assistance, right? So that's allowing people to maintain their independence. Providing access to your public restrooms. So this may consist of removing furniture that obstructs clearances. Allie and I went to lunch today and we had just got done you know, with the same presentation this morning and I went to the restroom and then she came back from the restroom and we both looked at each other and said, did you see the <laughs> obstructions in the restroom? So it's really easy to see. There's supposed to be clearances, for instance, um, on the side of the door where the doorknob is, it's called the strike side, and a person who uses a mobility device needs that clearance to pull their mobility device up and access the door to open it. If you put your garbage can in that space, which is a notorious place for people to put garbage cans in restrooms, it makes it really difficult for a person using a mobility device to access the door and have it in retrain so they can open the door. And I've been with people who use mobility devices that have gotten stuck in restrooms because of that. They can get in just fine, and once they get in, they realize they aren't able to access the door. So it's really important that not only do you do your architectural accessibility work to code, but that when you put in all of your add-ins later, that you're making sure that they are also accessible. So when you hang your soap dispensers, and you put in your air dryers and all those things, that's not gonna be part of the plan check process, probably, through your local jurisdiction, but you still wanna make sure that people with disabilities are able to access them. And then remove barriers to other amenities offered to the public, right? So anything that you're doing for anyone, you wanna make sure that you're inclusive of people with disabilities. So other examples of barrier removal, um, changing doorknobs to lever handles. So there's a requirement in the building code that says that doorknobs can't require grasping, pinching, or twisting. So that a person who doesn't have dexterity in uh, their hands, or maybe they don't have hands, they're still able to navigate in such a way that they can independently open the door. Repositioning shelves, restriping parking lots, 
Um, insulating lavatory pipes under sinks. So this is a really important one. Um, some people who use mobility devices don't have sensation in their lower extremities, and those pipes under the sink can be quite sharp and get quite hot. Um, and they might injure themselves and not know um, for quite some time that they have sustained an injury. So it's really important to insulate lavatory pipes. And there are little covers that snap on that you can order that are really easy. So those, that's one way you can Amazon next day. No, Amazon did not pay me to say any of this. I'm just, that's the first thing that I think of um, to get something done quickly. So laboratory pipe cover is a really easy way to ensure safety and accessibility. Installing full length mirrors. Um, so if all your mirrors are up high, then persons of short stature don't have access to the mirrors um, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of ways that we can provide access by re removing barriers. Alternatives to barrier removal. So if you have determined that the barrier is not readily achievable to remove, um, again, services need to be provided in another way. So it doesn't mean that you're off the hook to provide goods and services to people with disabilities. You just have to find an alternative way of doing it. So a different way of doing business. Um, so maybe retrieving items from shelves when you don't normally provide that service or relocating activities to accessible locations to make sure that people can participate. Maintenance of accessible features. So now we know how to provide services that are accessible and we know how to make our facilities accessible, but we're not done. We still have to ensure that we're maintaining the accessibility of all of those features in operable working condition. Isolated or temporary instruction, excuse me, interruptions are allowable. So if you have an um, elevator and there's necessary work that needs to be done to it, the elevator can be out of commission. It just has to be a reasonable amount of time. So you don't want the elevator to be out of commission for three weeks while you wait for a part, um, unless it's unavoidable. And if you know there's gonna be a service interruption, it's very important to communicate to everyone that's gonna be using that so that they know and they can make other arrangements during that time. Commonly neglected maintenance items are sink pipes, parking, door maneuvering clearances, and accessible toilet compartments. Um, another thing that's easy to maintain but often overlooked is the door pressure. Can't be more than five pounds to operate the door. There's a little device that you can use to measure the door pressure, and then you set the door pressure. I don't know how to do that adjustment. Our maintenance staff does that, but I know it can be done. Um, after you set it, a hot day, a cold day, can throw the door pressure off, and door pressures fluctuate. So you really want someone, whoever does your regular and routine maintenance, to check those door pressures regularly. So common physical accessibility barriers. So in California, construction-related ADA violations, the top 10 from January to June of 2019, were all in the areas of path of travel, parking, and access to goods, support services, and equipment. Some of the most common of these were routes to and from parking lots or public rights of way. So it's great if you put accessible parking in the parking lot, but then if you put planters and other obstructions along the path of travel between the parking and your entrance, you've rendered your facility inaccessible. So you've spent a lot of money and time putting in an accessible feature and then inadvertently reducing access. Um, so you wanna make sure that uh, paths of travel and routes are kept clear and in accessible condition and that you're maintaining them. Uh, parking, existing spaces are not compliant or they're faded, have excessive slopes. Uh, parking signage is a really important one. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have the correct signage. There's a sign that's required at the entrance to all parking lots and it's a tow away sign. And when you order that tow away sign from whatever signage company you get it from, it doesn't come with a phone number on it. And the whole purpose of the sign is to inform people that if they park in the accessible stall and they don't have a placard, they could be towed. And then to provide them with information to retrieve their vehicle. And I don't know if any of you have ever had your vehicle towed from a parking lot that didn't have that information on the sign. I have, I did not park in the accessible stall. <laughs> but it was in San Francisco, I was young. I don't really know what I did that required my car to be towed. But when I came out, my car was gone and there was no number on the sign. So I had to call the police department. It was a really long process. And, and you are responsible to put that number on there, and that's part of the requirements. So that's just a, an aside. Um, and then access to goods, support, services, and equipment. So counters, bars, and table heights must be compliant. This being out of compliance, again, is one of the top ADA-related violations. And then sale machines are not compliant or not accessible. Accessible routes, so the next couple of sections we're just gonna talk about some of the common areas of accessibility that you deal with in facilities. Um, accessible routes, lots of requirements for accessibility under accessible routes. Um, one clear path of travel must be inside and outside the facility, minimum of three feet wide, has to be clear of 
um, fixtures and furniture, like we discussed having planners and things in the path of travel. The surface has to be firm, stable, and slip resistant. So if it's an exterior path and it gets littered with gravel or leaves, you want to make sure you're maintaining the accessibility by keeping it swept and firm, stable, and slip resistant. Um, protruding objects is an important one. Um, this is so people with vision loss that are walking through the path of travel don't run into things. So something can't stick out more than four inches into the path of travel if it's wall mounted between 27 inches and 80 inches. And 27 inches is basically the lowest um, point where someone who uses a cane can detect. So you want to make sure that you're giving cane detection and allowing people opportunities to safely navigate through your accessible routes. I'm not going to go through all of these because we have limited time. There's lots of requirements, but again, Ali has been great about providing links. You can go look at these requirements um, in further detail. Lots of requirements under doors, clear widths, threshold allowances. Again, we talked about the operating effort of five pounds maximum, closing speeds, door hardware. So lots of requirements under doors. Really important because a door is often how people are accessing your facility. So that's a really important feature. Parking. So that table shows us of the total number of parking spaces you have, how many have to be accessible. And there are specific requirements related to van accessible spaces that are not depicted here in um, standard accessible spaces, so there's lots of requirements. Um, these parking spaces need to be identified with signage in a certain way and in certain colors that the floor surface is striped, excuse me, the ground surface. They have to be located on the shortest accessible route to the nearest accessible entrance. So if you have parking, the parking that's closest to the entrance has to be your accessible parking. And that's for um, individuals who may have difficulty traveling certain distances. Have to be adjacent to an access aisle, and there are clearances, uh, vertical clearance requirements as well. Access to goods. So put merchandise on shelves, service counters, and checkout aisles that are on accessible routes. If you have multiple checkout aisles and not all of them are accessible, um, and maybe you close some of them due to the volume of customers at any certain time in your store, make sure that one of them that remains open is the accessible aisle, right? So that people with disabilities are able to check out. Um, again, placing written materials within reach ranges. We talked about loading uh, materials in columns rather than in rows. And then providing uh, clear floor space. In general, 30 inches by 48 inches is clear floor space for a wheelchair to approach an item or feature. So for dining areas, um, it's great to have movable furniture in your dining areas because you can fix accessibility clearance issues relatively easy if you have movable furniture. So don't screw your furniture into the ground or floor. <laughs> it's going to make it very difficult if you get it all fixed in place and then you realize that you don't have the clearances for people to circulate throughout your facility. Um, knee and toe clearance, um, make sure if not all your seating is accessible, that accessible seating is dispersed. So much like with ticketing um, and as in assembly areas for events, people with disabilities want to be able to experience the different um, experiences and unique opportunities that sitting in different areas allow. So maybe one room of your restaurant is themed in one way and another room is themed in another way. You don't want to have all the accessible seating in one room because you have two different unique experiences to offer. Ensure people can uh, that items that are intended to be self-service are self-service and people with disabilities can um, operate independently. And again, non-fixed seating can be your best friend. Um, restrooms, make sure you keep them clear of clutter. Again, making sure that movable furniture is not put in places that are limiting or reducing access um, and that you're clear about where those additional items should go. Again, um, insulating pipes. So. Moving forward uh, with the building code, baby changing tables are not allowed inside accessible stalls. The reason that, they, that most people put them in accessible stalls is because that's the stall with the most room. And so you would think it would logically follow that if I have three kids with me and I need to change one of them, we can all fit in the accessible stall. But the problem is that this encourages people who don't have disabilities to use up the accessible stall. And then when people with disabilities that really need them and can't use any other stall come in, they're not available and they have to wait. Um, there's nothing worse than walking out of an accessible stall and seeing a person with a disability waiting for the bathroom. Um, so it's really important to make sure that all those other amenities, including baby changing tables, are not installed in the, in the accessible stall. So there are tax incentives for doing uh, barrier removal work, um, both uh, they're federal. There's the federal disabled access credit and the federal tax deduction. Um, and I am not tax expert, but there is a link. So when you get this, you can research more about what um, you qualify for. And staff training, really important. Don't forget to train your staff. 
This is all about people and civil rights and customer service, and you can do all of this facility work and policy work and really know your stuff, but if your staff is not trained in basic etiquette and awareness about interacting with people with disabilities and providing services to people with disabilities, then you could still be in violation of lots of accessibility laws and regulations. Um, it's also important to clarify that you can be in full compliance with the California Building Code and still violate the ADA based on how you're providing your services. So you really want to make sure that staff are trained and that they're aware. It's going to give you better customer service overall and you just have, be a more inclusive business and it feels better to walk into a place where everyone is included. So lots of wonderful information and resources online. So ADA.gov, again, I use that website all the time. It's great. They also have a page there called Project Civic Access. Um, and it lists all the settlement agreements that United States Department of Justice has entered in with both Title II and I believe Title III uh, entities. It's a great starting point if you're new to accessibility and you want to know sort of a template of where you should start. That's a great place to go because it details in the settlement agreement exactly what the agencies have to do um, or the businesses have to do to comply in the timelines that they've given them. Um, their timelines are much tighter. It's better to do these things on a voluntary basis. Um, once the Department of Justice tells you you have to do something, they don't give you very much time. So it's a really good idea to take a look at that. It gives you lots of information about where to start. The United States Access Board has wonderful information. The ADA standards can be found there and then also information about the public right of way. They also have a free technical assistance uh, line so you can call and ask questions of them as well. Um, full disclosure, anytime you contact the federal government and ask them an accessibility question, they're never going to put the answer in writing. I've asked. They won't do it. And they always say it depends. So this is a very individualized case-by-case -case basis again. So don't be frustrated by those answers. Don't hang up. Keep listening to what they have to say after because after that they usually have a bunch of really useful information that's uh, very helpful. And then again, the Pacific ADA Center. Um, this is for the region that you're in. They provide wonderful free technical assistance, live human beings that answer the phone and can help you with all of your accessibility questions. And this is how you contact them. You can email them, go to the website. Again, those are the services that they provide. And that concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, thank you for coming today. It's really exciting to see this many people interested in making their spaces and services accessible. So I thank you for that.